part two. Okay, I'd like to welcome you here today. Uh, this is a Department of Statistics regular seminar series. Um, it's the last one of the uh, fall uh, quarter and we'll resume in early Jan January. So we're very happy to have here today uh, Kevin Lin. Uh, as you can tell from the uh, slides which are presented, uh, Kevin is currently at the Department of Statistics and Data Science at the University of Pennsylvania, which uh, lives actually in the Wharton School, in the Business School, but it's an arts and sciences type uh, statistics department. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon Universe, University, which is also the uh, Department of Statistics and Data Science. And as you'll see today, uh, Kevin is going to uh, look at work, which although the application area is bioinformatics, is a very broad applicable method in cases, as we've discussed before, where you have um, big N but bigger P, where the number of variables is of the same order or even larger than the number of cases you might have. So in general, it's a general problem in uh, multivariate data analysis and multivariate modeling. I won't say so much more about that. Kevin, of course, will, will talk uh, about it. But the last thing I'd like to say about Kevin is that though he's, he's also has work in this uh, area, he also does a lot of work in network modeling and broader, what I'd, what I'd call modeling complex uh, statistical phenomena. So it's a very uh, general range of work that he uh, has, has on. And if you look at his website, you'll see a range of, of that uh, that is presented. All right, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Kevin with a round of applause and, and hand over to, to, to him. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for the warm introduction. So you can all hear me great? Yep, we're hearing you fine. Sounds great. So thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to give a talk. Uh, thank you to Professor Hancock for the invitation. So today I'm very excited to tell you about our work, which is exponential family embedding for single cell data with applications to developmental trajectory and differential expression. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but we'll, piece, we'll go through this piece by piece as the talk progresses. Let me just situate myself before I get too deep into the talk. Okay. So um, as we get started, what is single cell data? So single cell RNA-seq data sets reveal the cellular dyna dynamics within a tissue. So this is a particular type of data set that's really taken over the biological field over the last decade. So you might imagine different cells in let's say the brain or any tissue in general have different cell types, they have different roles. You might ask questions like how do one cells develop into different cell types as you grow older. You know, you might wonder about if you have a certain disorder, what do those cells look like when they're between cases and controls and which genes are different between cases and controls. There's a lot of questions that revolve essentially on the single cell level that we can now address with this high resolution. And essentially what happens is that before single cell data came along, this is before a decade ago, um, you basically had something on the bottom of this diagram, which is typically called bulk analysis, where you essentially sequence everything in a, a test tube that came from a particular tissue. So this could be brain tissue, lung tissue, and you could do quite a lot with this field, but the main problem is that you're essentially measuring the average gene expression among all the cells in let's say your test tube. And when you have questions that revolve around single cell dynamics, a lot of the cellular heterogeneity is masked, so you are somewhat limited in what you can answer. But you know, scientists still were able to answer a lot through like large cohorts of studies. But nowadays, since you can measure things on the single cell level, that's the upper part of this diagram, you can imagine you could separate out the green cells, the blue cells, the yellow cells, before you sequence them and see how the genes are expressed. And now you can see each different cell type has a different expression profile. And this can allow you to see a lot of the dynamics that you previously were not privy to, such as the heterogeneity, the subpopulation expression variability, a lot of things that we can now answer using single cell analyses. So this is very exciting. And that's why we're gonna devote our application to this particular, uh, that we're gonna devote our method to this particular application. So the single cell analysis pipeline has many steps that have been formalized in the literature. Um, I'm going to use this slide as a kind of a roadmap to guide ourselves on what particular task we're going to be focusing on today, and also what the downstream task for this 
uh, procedure is. So you might imagine my collaborators at a wet lab, they may give me a matrix that they collected, which is gonna look somewhat like the matrix I have on the left. So the first thing I might wanna do is screen the genes. You know, the genome has over 60,000 uh, genes and that's often a little bit too many to look at all at once. So we might filter this down to a couple of thousand, keeping only the relevant genes for our particular biological question of choice. And that's gonna re reveal this matrix that's gonna be N column, uh, N rows, for each of the N cells, once again, on the single cell level, and P genes for the P columns. And this is gonna be a count matrix, so it's gonna be basically non-negative integers, your one, two, all the way up to some possibly high number as an N by P matrix. And what do I do as a dry lab, as a, someone loading this into R? The first thing I might do is apply some dimension reduction, that's a PCA. You basically want to reduce the number of the amount of noise, and this can also simplify the calculations downstream. And also, you might want to do some clustering on this low dimensional space to find your, you know, essentially your cell types, things of this nature. And once you have this, you might want to do some more refined analyses targeted at whatever your biological question of choice is. I write two for example, right here. So one might be trajectory estimation, which we'll get into in just a few slides, develop, which is determining the developmental order from your young stem cells to your mature cells. What is the order of progression as cells develop and how do they change over time? And that might be one thing. Another thing might be differential expression, basically determining which genes are significantly different between cases and controls, kind of like a two sample test type of situation. So those are some particular applications. And what we're going to focus on in this talk is specifically the dimension reduction part. And we're going to talk about why that's going to need some improvement in just a few slides. But essentially, we're going to see that by tweaking the dimension reduction, it's going to have some downstream influence on our results in trajectory estimation or differential expression. So those are going to be the two main parts of the talk. Most of the talk is going to focus on the completed work, which is for trajectory estimation. And with hopefully uh, the last 10 minutes, if I have time left, I'll talk about some ongoing work for our differential expression downstream analysis. But that's the rough roadmap of what we're going to do. And before I get too deep in, in the, the woods, I just want to mention, you might wonder why not just use PCA, what is so special about single cell data that even warrants a new dimension reduction method. So when applying dimension reductions to single cell data, there are more or less two nuances to keep in mind. And so that's what I'm trying to allude to right here. Um, so these are two phenomena that have been cited throughout the literature many, many times here. I'm just mentioning Professor Lee's um, recent work that also mentions this, but you can see all, a lot of papers. So what are the two distinctive qualities? So in this histogram, I'm gonna to try to summarize this the best I can. So imagine in that count matrix, this non-negative matrix that's N by P, I look for each column, I count how many entries and that column are exactly zero. And that column could yield a value very close to one, in which case the entire column is basically zero, or it could yield a value very close to let's say 0.1, in which case only 10% of those values are zero. And if I look at a particular entry in that column, oops, my bad, um, we'll see that we have an extremely right skew distribution where once again, I'm looking at a column with 95% zeros, you see a little bit of threes and just one entry of four. So that's one thing we wanna keep in mind when we're modeling this data. But we can also look at the other side of the spectrum where it's still right skewed, but now we only have 5% of zeros and entries go all the way up to 30 and above. So you can see within this one data set, we have a lot of zeros, there's a lot of heterogeneity, it's all right skewed. So these are all challenges we'll like to keep in keep in mind when we're trying to model this single cell data using this dimension reduction. So that's one task. The other one I'll just mention very briefly is very analogous to what you might encounter for any uh, modeling for positive integer data sets such as text analysis or things of this nature. Sometimes it's the relative counts that are more important than the absolute count. So it's not like we want to predict or model the specific absolute entry, we want to model more or less the relative counts. So for example, if you see a count of four you, in a particular gene for a cell, you want to keep in mind that four is in proportion to all the counts, the row sum for that particular cell. So you might imagine this is nothing new in, in the field of multivariate analysis. You might imagine a lot of transformations can get you something close to a Gaussian distribution, like a TF-IDF in text analysis, or just a basic log normalization. Unfortunately, even though this is what a lot of people start when they analyze data, they make a great progress. At some point, uh, downstream analysis start getting distorted because you 
basically inflate the, the, you distort the ratio of signals between weak genes and strong genes, you're changing the variance. And a lot of things can go wrong if you try to analyze too fine questions with Gaussianizing data. So that's giving motivation to our talk. We're trying to model the data as it, on its original scale as best as possible, keeping in mind there's these two nuances we have to take care of. So that leads us into the first half of the talk, which is basically what we're going to study, which are all the good dendrocytes, and also the development of our method, which we call the ESVD, which is short for exponential family SVD. So the oligodendrocytes are cells in the nervous system that produce myelin and understanding the development can lead to better treatment for diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So this is just a very simple cartoon where in white you have basically the nerve and it's encapsulated in this yellow sheath that's going to be the myelin and that's basically uh, produced by the oligodendrocytes. And when your oligodendrocytes don't develop properly or there's too few of them or something goes wrong, basically there's not enough myelin produced and your nerve is left exposed and that's essentially what happens when you have have uh, MS. So that's why understanding the development of these cells in a healthy subject is important. And so what is what do we mean by development? So this is just another cartoon to illustrate this. So when we talk about development, usually we have a sense of cells changing properties, both physiologically and functionally as time progresses. So you might have an early stem cell that's colored as green in this cartoon, and it grows up all the way to become a mature oligodendrocyte in purple at the end. And we roughly know which these cell types are, but what we're interested in this particular part of the talk is how many types of mature oligodendrocytes do a, a stem cell grow up to become. For example, you might imagine all your stem cells grow up all to be the exact same type of mature oligodendrocyte. That's one possible scientific conclusion, or they might grow off and branch into two or three different types of oligodendrocytes. So that's a type of scientific question we're trying to answer using such a single cell analysis pipeline. And so let me just give you a quick schematic of what this pipeline looks like uh, Looks like in uh, terms of plots. So once again, we pre-process our data uh, beforehand, such as gene filtering and maybe some normalization. And then we basically use a PCA. In this particular case, we embed everything into, let's say, the first two principal components. That's fine. We haven't labeled the cells yet, so that's why they're all colored as black right now. Then you can apply your clustering method of choice. And in this particular case, the authors of this data set from Marquis et al., they basically find these different cell types. You can see the orange stem-like cells all the way up to your uh, myelin-forming magenta cells. And what do we mean by estimating a trajectory? It's quite simple in this particular case. So we're basically just going to estimate this path that basically smoothly interpolates this point mass along this low dimensional space. Um, so we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail when we get to the concluding parts of this section. But essentially, this is going to show you that your mature, your young stem-like cells in orange develop into the green cells, the blue cells, and all the way up to your myelin forming, the most mature cell types in this particular figure. So this came straight from the authors themselves, Marquis et al. And one of the things they weren't able to figure out in this analysis is that they weren't able to concretely pin down how many different uh, mature oligodendrocytes your stem cells grew up to become. And we're gonna see reasons for why that is in just a second um, when we get to the later parts of this talk. But this is essentially the framework we have in mind. And of course, when we change this embedding, you can imagine all the downstream analysis might potentially change. So keep this in the back of your mind and let's just talk about the embedding itself for the next few minutes. So the most common embedding is based on the SVD, it's very similar to PCA. And it's not actually desirable to model our single cell data of choice in this particular case. And in the very next slide, I'm gonna convince you of why. So that A for notation, B our count matrix, that's M by P. And we might have pre-processed it by now, so it might not be literally just count matrix now, it might not all be integers, but we're gonna have N cells in this case over 5,000 and P genes. So after we filter and screen the genes, we get down to roughly a thousand uh, genes. So that gives you a sense of scale. And basically these 5,000 cells are going to be partitioned into six different cell types that the authors provide. For example, your young stem cells all the way to your mature oligodendrocytes. So that's the data we're working with. And so what exactly is an SVD embedding? As you might imagine, it involves taking an SVD. And then essentially the SVD embedding is basically reweighting the left singular vectors by the singular values. Um, and you basically multiply it by this constant n over p over fourth for identifiable reasons. Not super important, but essentially you can just think of it as a reweighted left singular vectors. And then voila, you have your SVD embedding. That's all fine and dandy. 
And why do we think it's not so desirable to model our, our data set of choice? Or why do we think that there's some room for improvement potentially? And that's gonna be summarized in this particular slide. So imagine we have a fully observed M by P matrix. We can treat it like a matrix completion problem by purposely omitting 2% of the values. So we set aside 2% of the values. We, so, we set those values as NAs. And we basically use a matrix completion analog of SVD to predict those missing 2%. And we basically use this as a way to assess how well the model fit, uh, the model diagnostic is for this particular data set. So we can take a look at some qualitative features of the training set shown on the left or the test set, those 2% shown on the right, where we're plotting the observed values versus the predicted values. And we see in a solid red, we have the Y equals X line, that's a 45 degree line. And in blue, which is a little bit hard to see, you see basically the line that best interpolates the scatter plot. And we'll like that blue line, the principal angle right now on the left, on the right, it's 47 degrees. We wanted to track the 45 degree line as much as possible to have some confidence that our predictions are indeed a good prediction of the observed values. And so, you know, it's pretty close to 45 degrees. So that's great. The concerning parts start when we look at basically what I have denoted as a red rectangle. So this is going to be our prediction interval. Let's talk about how I got these intervals in just a second when I go to the next slide. But the concerning part is that you might notice that for low predictive values, the observed variability seems to be very high. But when you get for high predictive val uh, values, the observed variability seems to be very low. And this is counterintuitive to what we would have expected if a Gaussian model is truly uh, fitting for this data. Certainly, we would expect high counts to have high variability if you think of any count distribution like a Poisson. So the fact that it doesn't quite conform to our uh, assumed model assumptions or the ones we would have expected is a slight concern. And so that gives us some, some room for improvement potentially that we can improve upon. So with that in mind, let's first talk about what the SVD embedding and what the statistical model behind it is so that we can improve upon it and build upon it. So the SVD embedding, in fact, is actually a particular instance of a random dot product model using a Gaussian distribution with constant variance. So you can see why I made those prediction intervals a uniform rectangle before. It's because of this constant variance assumption. So what is the statistical model or how do you simulate from this model? So assume for each of your n cells, you have each of the cells is associated with a low dimensional vector, x1 through xn, drawn iid from some distribution g. We'll talk about the assumptions when we get to the theory. Um, but there's not many assumptions based on G. And similarly, for each of the genes, you have Y1 through YP sampled IID from some low dimensional distribution H. And why is this called a random dot product model? So for our observed single cell data that might have been pre-processed, we're going to model it uh, conditionally independent, a uh, condition on X and your Ys, that it's drawn from some single parameter distribution family F, where it's parameterized by theta ij for that single parameter. And we're going to set theta ij to be the dot product between the corresponding latent vectors for the cell and the gene. So you can kind of see why this is called a random dot product model. You certainly have a dot product here setting your, your, your single parameter and your x's and y's are random. So that gives a very intuitive flavor for the name. And what we're going to set the distribution family f to is any exponential family distribution that you tell me. So it could be a Gaussian with constant variance, it could be a Poisson, a negative binomial, as long as just one parameter, it fits in this framework. And you can imagine this is gonna help us handle the first of the two nuances, the fact that the distribution is so right skewed that we mentioned before. Certainly, if the data is right skewed marginally, you might want to use a right skewed distribution to model each entry. That seems like a very intuitive uh, first guess. And so you might set the distribution F to be the Poisson and set theta ij in this case to be the natural parameter for that Poisson distribution, for example. And so how would we estimate this model? It's a very intuitive idea. So once you give me the one parameter exponential family distribution f, say the Poisson or Gaussian with constant variance or the negative binomial, we're going to estimate the embedding x1 through xm by simply minimizing the lo negative log likelihood. I put MLE here in quotations because as we'll see in a few slides, it's not really an MLE because it's gonna be a non-comics problem, but you can think of this spiritually as an MLE. So this model is very similar to the ones uh, Professor Hancock has worked for in the past, latent space models for net, uh, modeling networks. And so let's take a look at what this objective function here. So here I just basically write down uh, the form of the exponential family 
uh, distribution where we have a log partitioning function G that depends on which exponential family you told me. And basically when I set G to be the appropriate log partition function for the Gaussian distribution with constant variance, I can work out the fact that this, is, uh, this objective is directly proportional to the one that is implicitly solved by SVD when it's performing its linear algebra operation, basically minimizing the, the sum of squares in basically for Benius norm. So in this sense, we can see why the SVD embedding is implicitly assuming some Gaussian uh, distribution with constant variance. That's observation number one. And observation number two is quite simply, we can replace this distribution G um, to the one that corresponds to a Poisson or negative binomial or exponential or whatever distribution, that's certainly gonna change the objective function. And once we optimize that, we basically have what we're gonna call the ESVD. There's a little bit more tricks involved, but certainly this idea is so straightforward. We are definitely not the first ones to study this. So many previous papers that use this similar formulation, what we're gonna to try to improve upon is because they either lack the modeling flexibility to handle single cell data, or they lack some desired theoretical properties such as identifiability conditions or what on earth you're converging towards. So let's basically use this slide to mention the background. So on the left on the spectrum, you have your non-convex statistics literature that some of us might be familiar with. So let me just give you some key highlights of this side of the literature. So typically, one observation is that if you optimize over X and Y, these two low rank matrices um, jointly, it's uh, computationally faster than trying to optimize that full N by P matrix. But now your consequences that your optimization is now non-convex. So you might need to invent some new statistical techniques. Luckily, this has been done for majority by analyzing the statistical rate of the local minimum by ensuring your iterations in your optimization preserve a special property that you need in your initial estimate. And that special property here that we're gonna need is called incoherence. We're not gonna get into the weeds uh, in this particular talk, but essentially this is some key property you need to show these statistical rates. But unfortunately, typically these have been done for matrix completion problems where the noise model is a Gaussian one. So not quite the ones we're thinking of with this right skew distribution. And it's typically about regarding the estimation for that full M by P matrix uh, not the rates for the embedding uh, X, that low rank matrix itself. So it's a little bit of a mismatch that gives us some opportunity to try to see what techniques port over when we're trying to study our method. So that's the, the methods that are more theory driven on the left and on the right, we have the biostatistics literature where they have really fancy dot product models where they add a lot of bells and whistles to model single cell data as best I can. But oftentimes they don't come with a uh, some intuitively obvious rates of convergence or consistency or identifiability, but they work very great in practice. So I just write some as example right here. So you might notice some of these are zero inflated. Once again, single cell data has a lot of extra zeros. So you might want to add a bell and whistle to model that extra amount of zeros explicitly. It turns out it's not so much needed for the newer data nowadays, but this was certainly um, an appealing feature uh, roughly five years ago. And all the way down here, we have GLM PCA. So this method, for those of us who might come across it, is very similar to the method that we're going to prescribe, except we're going to also do some diagnostics and it's going to, we're going to also worry about the downstream uh, analogs after you do the embedding. Um, and also you can just fit it as a topic model because once again, we have a matrix of non-negative integers. So that might remind you just fit a topic model and that's what some people actually do. This particular one I'm citing, it just happens to be a frequentist one, um, but you know, there's all these fancy methods and essentially we're gonna position ourselves somewhere in the middle. From the left, we wanna inherit that computational efficiency of those non-convex methods. And we also wanna inherit some of the theoretical foundations. And from the right, we wanna inherit the modeling flexibility to accurately model single cell data and also retain that dot product thing that is such a prevalent uh, aspect of this field. And certainly regardless of which side we're drawing inspirations from, we want to have a way to tune our methods such as for the latent dimensionality K. So before I get uh, too, uh, uh, too far, let me just mention one last thing. So the random dot product model can be modified to either explicitly or implicitly remove the effect of the cell's total counts S. This is the second of the two nuances I mentioned before, where we want to model the relative counts, not the absolute counts. So the first option is very simple. You just directly model the relative ratio um, with your exponential family distribution. And this is great for learning global patterns shared across many genes. This is what a lot of the softwares do nowadays anyways. 
But the reason this might not be able to model each specific gene, if you're interested in just a specific set of genes very well, is you can imagine if you divide on the left by some constant, it's certainly going to have some more complicated distortions on the right, which this model might not uh, be capturing, among many other things. So the other option you might do is explicitly or implicitly model it by adding it in into the ESVD framework itself. And so in this particular case, you can imagine we have that low rank matrix K, which is X, I times YJ, but now we're gonna add this basically observed covariate and that can be also handled in our ESVD framework. And this is great if you care about specific genes. We're gonna to come to option two later on in the talk, but right now we're gonna focus on option one. It's easy to understand, it's simple. And so what is the actual method? So ESVD performs a suitable initialization and then uses alternating minimization based on the negative log likelihood, as I described before. So once again, we're gonna minimize jointly over X, which is M by K, and Y, of, which is P by K. In this case, K is that low dimensionality, which is much, much smaller than N or P. And essentially, for those of us familiar with non-convex optimization, we have three steps that are almost the, the same frameworks for any of these methods. In this particular case, step one is going to be initialization. We're going to initialize based on some transformation of A. And then we do alternating minimization, where we fix Y, update X, or fix X, update Y. We're going to repeat this until convergence. And at the very end, there's some identifiability conditions we need to take care of for reasons I'll say in just a little bit. And so once we do these three steps, we're done. I don't have enough time to go through each of these steps in detail, but let me just put out some highlighting features of stage two, this alternating minimization step. And so these are the four equations where we're gonna keep iterating through it with this iteration counter T. So in the first step, because we chose to parameterize our exponential family using the natural parameter, we get a convex problem. So this is something you get for free for any exponential family distribution. So because it's a convex problem, we can solve fixing Y updating X using a constrained Newton method. So this is very similar to what you would do in a GLM anyways. Once we've run that to a convergence, we basically need to ensure some uh, identifiability conditions. So we need to reparameterize it based on its left singular vectors. This is for theoretical reasons, but also we encountered this actually does improve the performance computationally, albeit it, it requires some cost because you need to compute some SVDs. But in any case, we're going to then switch over to fixing X and updating Y, and we basically uh, iterate between these two until we have convergence. So that's what this step looks like. And so what is the rough overview of the theory that we prove? Um, I won't have too much time to go directly into the theory, but let me give you just some broad strokes of what we showed in our paper. So we prove convergence rates using theoretical techniques, drawing from, of course, non-convex optimization literature, but also the network literature. So there's gonna be three bullet points on this slide. That's basically three sections of theory we developed in our paper to help analyze what on earth is ESVD trying to estimating, what is it converging towards? Can we identify it? So the first part of these three is going to be understanding how well we're estimating that M by P matrix, that low rank matrix of natural parameters itself. And so very broadly, this requires understanding the sufficient conditions for that initialization. Those interested will recall, will remember from a few slides ago, I talked about that incoherence. That's essentially what comes to play for the sufficient conditions. And also we need to keep track of what happens at each iteration T by keeping track of what happens at the, for the minimization minimization at a population level. So essentially we wanna make sure that the sample iterates match the, the track, the, the population iterate. So this is a theoretical technique developed in these two papers that we inherit for our ESVD analysis. The next one is we don't particularly, aren't, we, we don't directly care about the estimation rate for that M by P matrix. We're more interested in how well we estimate the embedding itself. So basically we need to convert a bound from data to a bound on X. And essentially this process requires a careful study of your identifiability conditions to what degree can you separate X from Y and also perturbation bounds, such as your Davis-Cahans, your Stein, Stein data theorems. And basically once you have these two bullet points, you have a laundry list of assumptions that tell you at the very end, you have a rate of convergence based on how well you satisfy those assumptions. So of course, we'll like to show that there is a particular framework that satisfies all the assumptions. So when you apply these generic bounds to a specific distribution family, this is where you use all the fun tools we know as probabilist, empirical process, concentration bounds. And in this particular work, there's a lot of things we draw inspiration from, but one of them is uh, Candice and Pragyester's work. Um, so anyways, that's how you apply all these uh, things to a specific rate. And that's what we show in our paper. 
Um, and for now, for sake of time, I'm just going to focus on the second part because in reality, the, there's a lot of new techniques that are going to update how we, as, how we quantify how well we're estimating low rank matrix. So our work has been out for a little while, so there have been newer techniques since. So let's just focus on the part that is a little bit less resistant to the new uh, techniques that have been developed in the last few years. So in particular, when we're studying this middle slice, this middle bullet point, we need to encounter the fact, we need to face the fact that we have some huge identifiability issue. In particular, notice that if you posit any matrix R that's invertible, then since I model, I care about the dot product, this is my natural parameter, X, I, Y, J. If I multiply uh, X by R and multiply Y by the inverse of its transpose, I get the same exact distribution. Basically the R's cancel out. So this is essentially what we mean by identifiability. And if you work through what the consequence of this is, is that we can only identify these latent matrices, X and Y, such that drawn ID from their respective distributions, they have the same exact second moment matrix and they're both diagonal. So you can't identify things off of this and you can always reparameterize your estimates or your, your population models such that this condition is hold. So that's what we mean by identifiability issue. And the consequence of this is that when we go to look at the second bullet point I had listed before, when we're trying to tie the rate of estimating theta to the rate of estimating X, this is one example of the theory we show. So assuming sub-Gaussianity of X and Y, assuming the second moment matrix that is critical for the identifiability conditions have a sufficient eigengap. For now, let's just assume K is fixed. If you have all these ingredients and also you already have the uh, rate for the estimation of theta, then you can show that up to some trans from some rotation Q matrix, you can estimate this in for Benius norm with this rate. So this is a little bit of a mouthful. Let me just tell you the two takeaways from this particular equation. The first one is that this gives, gives us a nice way to uh, know when you have uh, consistent estimates. Basically, you need to estimate theta at a fast enough rate or else this won't go to uh, this won't go to zero, so that's one. And another one is that notice that these this assumptions that I posit up here, the sub Gaussianity, the sufficient eigengap, these are not necessarily the same conditions you need to get a good estimation rate of theta. So remember theta is more about the exponential family distribution, but this is about those distributions G and H, the in, in a hierarchical sense, this is one step up in the hierarchy. So these are not all the same conditions and that's what you can uh, discern using this type of theory uh, to investigate the method. So that's a little bit about the theory. Let's now turn our eyes to see what it looks like when we apply it to the oligodendrocytes. Um, and just see how I'm doing well on time. Okay, I'm doing well. Um, so now we have this ESVD method. Let's see how it works when we try to re-estimate the trajectories for our oligodendrocytes. So for our oligodendrocyte data set, as we investigated more, we found that it has more intrinsic variability that modeling it with a somewhat unconventional distribution, a curved Gaussian distribution, it turned out to be most suitable. So what is a curved Gaussian distribution? Remember, we're modeling the relative counts directly in this part of the work. And a curved Gaussian is where you have a Gaussian and if you have mu as the mean, your variance is set in relation to the mean. So in this case, the variance is gonna be mu squared over four. Essentially, the standard deviation is mu over two. And if you work through the natural parameter for this type of distribution, it's gonna be, uh, negative uh, one over the, the mean. And one of the appealing parts of this curve Gaussian distribution for single cell data was that most of its mass was positive. And even though it's a slightly unconventional distribution to use, we found it useful because the variability can be much larger for this curve Gaussian distribution. So remember for Poisson, the mean is scaling linearly with the variance, but here the mean is scaling linearly with the standard deviation. So a lot more variability we can capture. And all these constants of four or late dimensionality K, they can all be tuned using our matrix completion diagnostic, such as the one shown here for this particular choice. So once again, we split our test set and training set. So we purposely omit 2% of the entries in our M by P matrix. And now we're modeling data on its raw on the relative count scale. And essentially we see that we have a blue line which tracks the 45 degree line well. So that's great. We're tracking the Y equals X line as best we can. But now you'll notice that the prediction interval is a cone. And that makes sense because now the standard deviation is growing linearly with the mean. And we see, as opposed to last time, now a lot of the points lie within the cone. 
that's great. And another thing that's great is that now we see the variability indeed is increasing as the predicted value goes up, which is our intuition of how count data should be uh, acting. So this gives us a, a green light to try to see what happens to our downstream trajectory analysis. So in contrast to the original results in Marquis and all in 2016, our ESVD embedding enables us to discover two branching trajectories in the downstream analysis. So remember from the earlier parts of the talk I mentioned in the original paper, they weren't quite able to tell how many trajectories there were specifically in mature oligodendrocytes. And now we can confidently say there are two. We'll go through the plots right here. But before I show you the plots, there's gonna be a lot of colors. So let me tell you what my color scheme is. So there's gonna be six major cell types from your youngest cells up top colored as orange, all the way to your oldest cells, your mature oligodendrocytes, which I'm gonna reserve three colors for, that'll be apparent in just a minute, which are gonna be yellow, dark blue, and gray. And not only do the authors have the labels for the major cell types, they also split some of the cell types into their cell subtypes. So for example, there's six subtypes for mature oligodendrocytes. And so when we apply SVD to this data, akin to what we did early on in the talk or ESVD using this curved Gaussian. We're gonna fit a three-dimensional latent distribution, but we're going to just uh, visualize the, the second and third latent dimension for now. And let's just see, because both these methods are unsupervised, we just see this mass of black points, but we do know the cell type labels provided by the author. So let's overlay that onto the plot. And we can see on the left, you have your young orange cells, which are your stem cells, develop all the way into these mature oligodendrocytes as yellow. There's a little bit more of a mess on the right, which I'll get to in just a second. But if we use our trajectory estimation onto this low dimensional space, in this case, we're gonna use slingshot, which is the more modern trajectory estimation method. Basically it's mess estimating a smooth curve that interpolates this mass of points. We're gonna see that on the left, let's just talk about the SVD embedding for now. We technically get two trajectories, but you can see they heavily overlap with one another. And this mimics a lot of the intuitions that Marquis and Oss claimed in their paper, where we can see why it's not super clear how many trajectories there really are. You know, you see two, but they are heavily overlapping. Is this just because of noise? Are there really two? But on the right, we see that there's two very separate trajectories that are swinging off in different directions. Um, one colored as blue, one colored as yellow. There's a little bit hard to see in two dimensions. So let's just visualize the same exact data, but now in the full three dimensions. On the left for the SVD embedding, we see that even when we visualize it in the full three dimension latent space, the two trajectories are still heavily overlapping. Once again, akin to the fact that Marquis and all weren't able to figure out what was going on with the mature terminal oligodendrocytes. But we see even the full three-dimensional space, these two trajectories are swinging off in two different directions. And we see now why we color some of the oligodendrocytes as blue, the ones closer to the blue trajectory, and some of them as yellow, the ones closer to the yellow trajectory. And the gray one are basically the subtypes that are stuck in the middle between it branches off in two different directions. You might also wonder, you know, is it up to noise that we were able to estimate two, but they look like the same on the SVD side. So we develop a, a diagnostic to assess this based on the bootstrap. So we can visualize the uncertainty of these trajectories by constructing uncertainty tubes in the following fashion. So we fix the embedding, fix the cell type lineages, resample the data and re-estimate the trajectories via slingshot. And basically we just construct a uniform cube based on the largest 95 deviation among the bootstrap samples. So we see within this pre, uh, bootstrap uncertainty cube, both trajectories are located within this cube, which gives us some confidence on why Marquis and all were enabled to disentangle what happens with the mature oligodendrocytes. It's partly because of the lack of fit for the ESVD, and it's also partly because both trajectories, if you commit to the SVD embedding, seem to be very close to another up to chance up to um, this bootstrap uncertainty cube. But when you try to emulate the same procedure for the ESVD embedding, you see that both trajectories are still swinging off in two different directions. They don't overlap at the tail end. So this gives us some confidence that this really is two different trajectories. And it turns out in a lot of follow-up work by Marquis et al, co-authors or others, when they analyze new data with more nuanced methods that they develop independently, uh, they also were able to see that there are finally multiple oligodendrocyte uh, trajectories. So this is basically, we applied a new method on older data to recreate um, the results that match what the newer data sets were telling. So that's great. So this is all we have to show for the uh, differential trajectory part of the talk.
And now I'm going to wrap up to the last part of the talk from the last 15 minutes, which is basically our ongoing work. The application of not the embedding per se, but now the denoising part of the ESVD and how we're gonna apply it to gene differential expression. So this is ongoing work. Unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about this in full detail with the remaining 15 minutes, but my goal here is just to motivate why we even wanted to, why we even thought of the idea of using ESVD paired with the differential expression analysis. There's going to be a lot of details that I have to omit for sake of time, but hopefully when the preprint of this comes out in a few months, you can look at the details then. So, let me just very briefly talk about what is differential expression. So compared to developmental trajectory estimation, uh, differential expression is a much more nuanced task because now you're tasked with finding specific genes that are significantly different between your a priori labeled case and control subjects, adjusting for some known covariates. So this essentially is a hypothesis test of means very simple. We as statisticians are very familiar with this, but you just need to account for the, the quirks in the data, such as the modeling assumptions, the right skewness I mentioned. You want to remove the effects of the total count. So all those nuances with single cell data still percolate when you talk about differential expression. And typically what's done is you perform a regression, one per gene to get a p-value. So you're going to end up with one p-value per gene, where you're basically regressing the raw counts you see for that particular gene onto the covariates, and you're going to do this using a negative binomial model. So uh, this is a different paper by Professor Lee, but they and collaborators have a nice review paper on this topic. But let's just use the schematic on the left to illustrate what's going on. So pretend this is one of the P columns of your count matrix. And basically, you have some cells that originated from case individuals and some cells that originate from control individuals. And you want to know, is there a mean difference between these two case and control? And you want to model it accounting for some covariates such as, as I mentioned before, the total counts across each of the cells, the row sum. So you can see that if we do this regression based on the negative binomial, you look at like the likelihood ratio test or the wall test or things of this nature, or you might do a non-parametric Wilcoxon rank sum test, you can see how we're going to handle those two quirks of single cell data, that right skewness and also the fact that we want to model the relative counts. We can handle that all that within this framework. You might notice though something a little odd is that the reason we can believe there's some room, room for improvement is that you're doing this regression separately for each gene. And you might imagine if you remember this single cell data is very, very sparse. A lot of the genes have almost 80 plus percent zeros. So if your signal is quite weak, your regression done on this particular gene might miss it. So you can certainly capture the strong signals, the genes that are strongly expressed in both cases and controls. But for genes that are barely expressed in both cases and controls, this method might miss it. So you might think of, oh, maybe why don't we pull some information across the cells? Maybe we can denoise some of the zeros to be slightly non-zeros and then do a, a hypothesis test. Wouldn't that be a good idea? And even though many people have tried this, it's been shown consistently throughout the literature that unfortunately this dramatically inflates your type one error. So if you do something like a PCA followed by a model agnostic test, such as a Wilcoxon ring sum test, it's been shown in many papers that in practice, you dramatically inflate the type one error. There's a lot of reasons on why this happens and that I can talk about at the very last slide when I conclude. But for now, let's just keep in mind one of the many reasons is that you lack, you did not handle the different variabilities across the genes. So once again, think of the fact that we're modeling each entry that's say with the Poisson or negative binomial or curve Gaussian, the mean is tied to the variance. So when you see a large value, when you're testing, let's say a Wilcoxon test, even though it's a large mean, it sometimes can be attributed to, and it's also tied to a very large variance. And if you just treat everything with equal variance, you're going to miss that. So that's one of many reasons that uh, a dimension reduction followed by a model agnostic test can dramatically inflate type one error. And what we're gonna position ourselves in this ongoing work is how do we use ESVD to resolve this? So there's gonna be many steps of this and I'm only gonna have time to talk about how we use ESVD to start off this method. And once we fit that ESVD, there's gonna be many procedures to get from the fitted ESVD to the p-values, which we won't have time to discuss, but if people are interested in, we can talk offline about that. So how do we use ESVD to, uh, to 
get ourselves started and why did we even want to tackle differential expression using the ESVD? That's all gonna be summarized in this slide. So we thought ESVD would be suitable for downstream differential expressions for three reasons. The first one is that you can pull information across cells in this dimension reduction uh, sense. So that's great. You can denoise the zeros to be slightly non-zeros. Second, because we're using the exponential family, we can model the mean variance relation, whether it's a negative binomial, as I illustrate here, or Poisson, things of that nature. And third, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about the two options, you can include the covariates directly into ESVD. So you have some known covariates and you can estimate also the latent, um, latent factors simultaneously. So that's why we thought ESVD would be a very suitable candidate to try to work through and how to get differential expression to work downstream. So in this particular case, let AIJ be a raw single cell count. This is a non-negative integer. And basically, we're going to parameterize the negative binomial for sake of simplicity right now uh, by the mean, where the mean is basically the exponential of what we're going to call the natural parameter. For those of us who work with negative binomials, we might know this is not literally the natural parameter for the negative binomial, but we reparameterize it in this way such that things are still convex, so things are still good. And essentially, when we look at what this data is, once again, very similar to what we had mentioned a few slides ago, we can model some fixed covariates. So in this case, one of these columns could be the total count across all your N cells, but you can include a lot more covariates because now you have information about which cells came from which individuals, how old are those individuals, which part of the body do the cell come from, all these things we can slap onto this uh, covariate matrix C. And this would be a known thing. And you can imagine, had we only cared about doing things uh, gene by gene, you would simply do a GLM tying your observed count matrices A to your covariate C. But we want to do this in a denoising way. So that's where these latent factors come in, these X and Y matrices. So these latent vectors are the ones responsible for denoising and sharing the signal across the matrix. And our ESVD uh, method can be repurposed to handle all of this. And of course, at the very end, we need to estimate the dispersion over dispersion parameter. This is essentially how much extra variability the negative binomial has over the Poisson. And so we can tune this for each gene. Once again, because we care about the p-values, we not only want to estimate the mean, but we want to get a sense of that variance as accurately as possible, because this will have a lot of downstream effects on the resulting p-values. And so what do we call the denoised uh, gene expression? We simply omit those covariate effects. And that's what we're gonna call a denoise expression. So note in particular, I'm writing the entire distribution here, not just the mean, because once again, we wanna know what the mean and the variance for an, each individual entry is. And we're gonna percolate that all the way down when we do that p-value one per gene. And so essentially, I'm gonna omit a lot of the extra details for the sake of time, but in summary, to demonstrate how to perform differential expression downstream of ESVD, we're gonna analyze a slightly different data set. We need to use a different data set because we need some cases and some controls. And in this particular case, we're gonna analyze layer two, three. This is a particular type of cell in the brain um, from this particular paper where their cases are reflecting autistic individuals and you have some controls. So the procedure after you fit ESVD is that you need to aggregate and adjust all those means and variances from a cell level for those entry-wise, that full N by P matrix, you need to aggregate that into the individual level. And you're gonna do this in a central limit theorem-like fashion, a CLT-like fashion, because each individual contributes thousands of cells. So when you start aggregating it, you're gonna get some more and more Gaussian looking like shape. And once you have one Gaussian for each individual, you do some hotel and key squared like tests between your cases and controls. The reason we choose a hotel and key squared um, is because you want to preserve the fact that it's a different mean, but also different variances. And I'm omitting a lot of the steps going on to these two bullet points right here, but uh, when we release our preprint, you can take a look at it. But once we follow through with this procedure, we get basically the volcano plot, which is very common in single cell analyses, which on the X axis, you have the log two mean difference. So this is essentially the log mean difference between case control. So you can imagine this is a proxy for how much signal is in the data without any additional modeling. And on the Y axis, you get our negative log 10 P values, where the higher it is on the Y axis, the more zeros it goes out in the decimal places. So the more significant it is. And you might imagine I have one point for each gene right now and I color them a little bit differently. So the two colors are red 
and the red if it's the published differential expressed genes in these or in this original paper, and if it, it's green if it's a negative control. So in a lot of genomic analyses, we have different ways to get a negative control. In this particular case, we're using genes that are known as housekeeping genes, so genes that are known to be not differentially expressed between different conditions of the brain. So those are going to be our negative controls. Those should not be significantly different. And so when we convert all these p-values into the corresponding z-scores, we'll notice some misspecification under the null. This is very common in single cell analyses because no model is perfect. So we, use, we correct for it the best we can using empirical Bayes. That leads to a Bayesian FDR control of 0.05. And once we do that, we basically see that of the 5,000 genes shown in this plot, this cutoff has selected 87 genes, over half of which were published in this original paper by Rashemi et al. So that's a great enrichment. And certainly when the preprint comes out, we have a lot more things for our different cell types and a lot more conditions and simulations, so on and so forth. But this is just to give you a flavor on why we thought ESVD was even a suitable candidate for a differential expression analysis downstream. You see, we need to work a little bit harder. We need to tweak the procedure a little bit, but hopefully this was good enough to give you a high level overview of what this direction is that we're going in. So to conclude, this talk, this is the very last slide. In summary, ESVD is a dimension reduction method based on exponential families. And as we've tried to show, it is suitable to downstream developmental trajectory and also differential expression analyses for single cell data, mainly because it's modeling the mean variance relation. And that has a lot of benefits when you're trying to tackle single cell data sets. So ongoing work for this preprint that we're working on for differential expression, for those of us who might have skimmed the paper, you might notice some of the details I mentioned in this talk is not quite the same as the one in the JAZA paper. That's because while developing this ongoing work, we improved the computational backend, we improved the optimization, which helped a lot also. And also there's the big elephant in the room that I completely did not have time to talk about, such as estimating those extra nuisance parameters, say for the negative binomial. We had one per gene, how did we get those? We needed to design a way to estimate those. How do we handle that? And also the more important issue on why differential expression is so hard when you follow it up with the dimension reduction, something called oversmoothing. And so very briefly, I'll just say that oversmoothing basically means your significantly expressed genes are bleeding their signals onto the genes that weren't supposed to be differential expressed. So we also need to handle a way in that two bullet points I had in my last slide, we had ways to counteract this that I didn't have time to talk about today. But after we finish this preprint in a few months, there's, of course, some very interesting theory work that we'll like to tackle in the near future. And I just write three of them that came to the top of my head. So the first one is the role of initialization when analyzing the statistical minimum, uh, the local minimum uh, for ESVD. So as I mentioned, there's been a lot of new techniques from the tensor community, from the matrix factorization community, from the deep learning community on how to analyze non-convex problems such that you want to rate for the local minimum. And a lot of it goes down to you need to first initialize it properly and percolate those benefits of the initialization all the way to your local minimum. So there's a lot of interesting theory that we'd like to pour it over to ESVD to sharpen the rates, loosen the assumptions, things of this nature. The next one I have right here is that as we might have remembered for a lot of exponential families. So let me just say an example first, and it makes sense what I'm trying to allude to in this bullet, in the second bullet point. So imagine you have a binomial distribution where both N and P are unobserved and you're trying to estimate it from a single uh, vector. And so if both N and P are observed, is the, if the true P is very, very small, such as 0.000001, that means the probability of flipping head is almost impossible. Then in your data set, you're going to see a bunch of zeros for zero heads, but you have no idea how to estimate n anymore. So in some sense, when you have these nuisance parameters for exponential family distributions, um, sometimes there's a regime where you just can't possibly estimate that nuisance parameter at all. And you might want to think that idealistically, because we're modeling in a matrix factorization sense, maybe we can overcome that. And it's not super clear. We have some initial uh, simulations that show that it's still a very hard problem, even though you're trying to do this in a matrix factorization sense. So that's something very incredibly interesting to me to analyze from a theory perspective. And of course, the very last thing, I had constructed those confidence uncertainty cubes for those trajectories. This is certainly related to the ridge of a density for those of us familiar with 
uh, non-parametric analysis for analyzing low dimensional densities. And that might be a way to pour over some insight on how to make these confidence cubes a little bit more rigorous on what exactly is being contained with 95%. So with that all being said, thank you so much for your time. I went a little bit over, but hopefully you forgive me. And so thank you so much. Great, let's thank uh, Kevin. We do have time for questions. So either in chat or um, uh, speaking forward, let's see if there are questions involved. I'll bring up the chat here. Either from people here or people in the audience on online. Well, well, that I will wait for that. I have one. Um, Kevin, could you just expand a little on how you choose K, the dimension, the dimensionality mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. it? Of course. It's a, yeah, it's very important. That's a that's a great question. So what we found um, in our work is that this matrix completion diagnostic they choose very sensible parameters. So essentially when we're choosing K, we basically split into a training and test set. Those are those 2% uh, of purposely omitted values. Um, and what we want to see is we want to pick the K such that the principal angle, this one dimensional line that interpolates the scatter plot as best as it can, it both is very close to 45 degrees. So that's one criterion. And the second criterion is that most of the points or at least the correct proportion of points based on how we design this prediction interval falls within actually this interval. So we have two kinds of metrics and basically um, by choosing using these two metrics, we found that in simulations, we usually pick, sometimes we pick, we overpick the K, but that's fine. Um, we usually pick the sensible K, at least a K where the local embedding seemed like a sensible one. So that's mm -hmm. how we chose it in our particular work. Um, and it seemed to have worked pretty well. We're pretty happy with it. Okay, good. Questions from, from others? I've got plenty of questions, but let's, um, <laughs> I'd rather not ask them all. I'm happy to give time. All right, here's my second one. We'll give other people a little time to think. So um, in the core alg algorithm, do you know if that's a um, MM algorithm, a majorization, minimization? Um, let me think. I'm actually, I have not thought about this before. Honestly, we have, we have been so fixated by framing it as an alternate minimization because this was so common. We, yeah. I actually have not thought about if there's a different way to formulate this. So, so yeah, I'm not sure, but that is yeah. certainly a very interesting thing to think about. Yeah. I, huh. I think it is, but you have to sit and Work, you know, just work through the yeah. <laughs> steps, but I, I, I think it is. All right, other, other questions from folks? I'll, I'll just mention very briefly, um, this work that I'm citing right here was originally for the EM algorithm. So certainly mm -hmm. some sure. parts of the theory can port over, um, but I'm not sure to what degree it ports over or if it's only the theory, but not the actual computations. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I have to think more about that. That's a curious yeah. thought. Okay. Other questions from folks? Okay, I have just one other where we have it. Just to be sure, when you fit the, the curve, when you say curved Gaussian, it's curved because it's a curved exponential family, right? So that's, yes. that's where the connection mm -hmm. is. And the, the question is, so it's, you, would you consider using a Poisson log normal version of, of this where F takes into account the count nature of it? Was that con considered? Um, I don't think we actually tried that because typically, um, honestly, I'm not sure why that never occurred to me. Yeah. Um, I must have some reason why I didn't try initially when we were thinking about this, but, uh, the main ones we compared against were the negative yeah. uh, binomial and Poisson. So I'll need to yeah. think if. It was just an oversight on why we didn't try the log normal, but I think we had some reason. I just haven't thought about it in such yeah. a long time that I forgot the answer. Well, it's um, going to add certainly, another parameter, obviously. Yeah, and, and yeah. certainly it's uh, it's it's very uh, right tail, which would be would make it seem like a good choice. But um, I'll need to think about that also. Um, certainly, 
uh, our framework can handle any exponential family distribution as long as you give me the appropriate gradients and Hessians for that G function. So in terms of, can we try it now? Certainly, um, I'll just need to think about um, if in general, I would want to try in a data set, certainly for this data set, since it has so much variability, I think for this particular data set, it would be a good thing to try also. Yeah. Great. So we have last last chance for questions either in the room or over Zoom in, in chat. All right, let's thank Kevin again. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was a great opportunity.